one through seven. Can you even the seven? Get started with the lecture of CISP 310. All right. Don't forget to record, of course. It is recording. All right. Double check it right now. So it is recording. And if I look at the command line, that should also indicate it's recording. Yep, it is recording. All right. So before I forget, I'm going to upload the video from the previous class. Alrighty, so let's go ahead and get started with uh, this class. I'm changing the ordering of the topics a little bit in case you haven't noticed. I'm skipping over the non-integer representation stuff, uh, which is basically floating point numbers and stuff like that. So I'm kind of jumping over that one to actual assembly language program. Okay. Um, most of you missed what I did today, so I feel that you know I should probably do it again. How many were in? The, the club meeting this today in the uh, at about noon time. I don't see anyone here in the club meeting. Okay, so I can either play the video of what I did, or I can just do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Okay, so let's do it again. Okay, so this is about hacking, and this is about you know this is the stuff that we are about to do, and knowing how to do this stuff, you know, will let you, you know, kind of turn into turn you into a semi hacker. Okay. All right, so what we'll do is I'm going to write a program, and I'll call this program, get str, okay. And I'm just going to write the C code first, and then I'll explain what it does, okay. So here we have a function, you know, void f. Um, it doesn't do anything except it tries to read in a string, okay. That's all it's trying to do. So it's going to do a char buffer, I give it 16 characters, and then I say get as buffer, get string. Basically, it's trying to read a string from standard input file, otherwise known as C in for those of you who like C++ better than C, okay? But it's the same idea, okay? It's trying to read something from standard input file and into the buffer array. Make sure I get a semicolon here, and that's all it's going to do. Okay, not a whole lot of useful, useful stuff. And this return obviously is not needed, but I just want to put it here. Here's the main program, which doesn't do a whole lot. Okay, it's going to call f. It's not even going to bother to process what f has to say. And I'm going to introduce a variable called x here. And I say x is one, x is, x gets one. And then I say if x, I do this part here, else I do this part here. And some of you can immediately recognize and say, but it's always going to execute the then branch. Yes, it is, and that's the whole point. Because what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, over here, I'm going to say print f. Uh, so, uh, so you're going to somehow try to change x? No, I'm not changing x. By hacking. I'm hacking it so that it would go to the the branch that I want to get into. Okay, so over here it's going to say uh, successful authentication. There we go. Okay, so here's a program. It is really a very simple program. It's a, just a shell, and obviously you can see that according to the logic of main, I will never get authenticated because it doesn't even bother to process what I type as the password. What will happen? Okay. Is that okay? But I want to hack this program because maybe in the else branch, after it prints the successful authentication, it would actually do something that's useful. Okay? Maybe this is the code of a program that has some kind of authentication check in order to make sure that I have the right license to run it. And I want to hack it so that I don't want to get the right license to run it. Is that okay? Does everybody kind of understand you know, what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to trick this program. Okay. So we'll go ahead and compile the code and run it. And you probably already know what it is going to do. So I'm going to do a GCC dash o get stir get stir dot c. It's just a command line way of compiling. 
um, kind of ignore the warning and the implicit messages you know, at this point. And well, you, you can see what it is, how it is described. This function is dangerous and should not be used. Okay, but I'm gonna use it anyway because you know somebody told me this is what I read in C C plus plus programming for dummies. Okay, it says go get it. It's great. Use it. Okay, so I'm gonna use it. Okay, so now we run the program. We say your dot slash get string. Okay. And I give you my password, it's like whatever, press the enter key, authentication failed, and you know, I can I can do this all day long and it will only give me authentication failed because the code of the program should not give me successful authentication. Is that okay? It's hard coded to deny me access to the program. So now the question is can I still trick this program to give me access? Okay, or at least continuation, continue execution where it says uh, successful authentication. Okay, so that's what we want to do. What are, what are we going to do to hack this program? Overload the string. Sorry? Overload the string. Overload the string, which means you're trying to give it more characters than it is supposed to handle. Okay, very good. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. So the first step to hack a program like this, okay, the first thing I'm gonna do is I will copy this program, you know, the executable, into a different name, okay, get string one, okay? And then I'll run the program called strip to the original executable. Strip as a command is going to remove all the symbols from the executable. So this way there's no linking uh, from the executable back to the source code. Okay, so I'm trying my best not to cheat. Okay, so I'm assuming the symbols are all gone, I don't have access to the source code, and yet I'm still trying to hack this program. Okay, the question is, can I hack it? Okay, so what we'll do is we will go ahead and you know give it a test file. It is really a lot of trouble to try to type everything by hand every single time. So what I will do is I'm going to create a text file, exploit.1, and just kind of enter a bunch of gibberish nonsense, okay? Doesn't matter what it is, okay? It just has to be enough characters to cause the program potentially to fail, okay? But even before this step, okay, no, 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 I don't want to do encryption. Why is it? Is it uppercase? Yep, okay, there we go. Okay, so the other thing I can do is to run a particular program called OBJ dump, object dump, okay? Object dump is really kind of cool because you can make it display all the header information of an executable. You can also make it disassemble code and we want it to disassemble this particular executable. And I'll pipe it through less so that it is paged, okay? So it shows us you know, a few you know, really kind of useful information and the cool part is it displays the instructions in this particular program. So what you're seeing here, you know, uh, after disassembly of section dot init, that is showing you the actual assembly code, okay? And that's what we're gonna learn in this class, okay? Because what I wanna do is to show you what you can do once you understand assembly language programming and how memory is used by a C, C++ program. So we can see some of the things here, but one thing I can see that might be of interest to me is the call to get s. Because I know already <coughs> that get s is not a good function to call. I know already that it is dangerous. So if I go through the source, not the source code, but if I go through the executable of a particular program, and I can identify and say, hey, this program is calling get s, I can immediately say, hey, maybe I can hack this program. Is that okay? It is a very good first clue to say that, hey, this program may be hacking. And what we'll do is we'll say, okay, get me all the places, okay? Find me all the places where get s is mentioned. Okay, here's one. It's calling a particular place with get s in it. Um, we have a few other places, uh, which is great. Okay. And then the other thing that we can also look for in this particular program is put s. 
or put string. Put string is the same thing as C out for those of you who like C and C++ programming. All it does is it's going to send some string to standard output file. Okay, so I'm looking for those things, and I'm looking for specific calls to put s, and I find two over here. Okay, do you see? Uh, th there's a call here to put s, and there's another call here to put s. So these two are responsible to print uh, authentication failure or successful authentication. How do I know that? Well, maybe it has something to do with 40062A and 400614. Because those are the things that is being passed to the subroutine. Okay? I'm talking about this item here, and I'm talking about this item here. Are there any questions about the rationale? Yes, no, okay? Just a general idea, okay? So I can actually go to those locations. Maybe I can get to those locations. Six, uh, what again? I'm trying to fi find out. 62A is one, and then 614 is the other one. So let's go to 614. It is past the end of you know, the, uh, the section that, I'm, that is being displayed here. So maybe another option of object dump can do that. So we'll go ahead and do a man OBJ dump. You know, in Linux, you know, man is a best friend, not the gender. Okay, man the program. Okay, it's, it stands for manual. It gives you information of how to use you know specific commands. So in this case, I want disassembly does not get that. Maybe disassemble all will get it. And let's see what else can we do with this. Call headers. So we'll, we'll begin to try a dash uppercase D and see if we can get past the end. Four zero zero. Okay. We're trying to find the two calls again. Right here, these are the two calls. So the addresses were 614 and 628. So let me see if I can find those. 612. What, what, about the, what, what were the addresses again? I cannot remember. 614. Okay. So 614 is one. Okay, let me just write it down. 614 and 628. And then two. There, and then there are two more addresses that are important because. Um, the branch, the in this particular location, and also uh, this location is important okay? because these represent um, a branch in a conditional statement. Now, how do I know this is representing a branch of a conditional statement? It's because I know this is right after a unconditional branch instruction. The, the instruction about this one is a JMP, which is just like a go-to, okay, it is unconditional. So why would you put any code right after a unconditional go-to? Because it's one of the branches, okay? So we will learn how to write code like this, okay, in this class. But from experience, I can tell that these two locations are important. But I need to know which one is which one, okay? Which one is saying successful login and which one is not successful login. So I still need to look into that. So what I need to do is now I, I go to these two locations, 614 and 62A. Six, whoops, uh, here. 614 is down here. And it doesn't look like much to me, okay? You look at this whole bunch of gibberish here. It's like, no, that's not a string. It is a whole bunch of instructions. In fact, it is not a good instruction because if you look at the first one, what does it say? Bad. Bad. Okay. But when you look at the byte values, does it remind you of something? They're all kind of six something, seven something, there's a bunch of two zeros and whatnot. What do they correspond to? ASCII. ASCII code, okay? Because lowercase ASCII code maps to you know, six and seven in hexadecimal. Two zero is a space. So once you learn how to read ASCII code in hexadecimal, 
this is what you would pick up. Okay, you would just say that, oh, this is a, this may be a whole bunch of characters. Okay, and then you can just map it. You can just look at six one and say, okay, what is the ASCII character corresponding to six one as a hexadecimal number? Okay, let's look it up. How do we look up you know ASCII code table? Google it. Or man it. Yes, man is now becoming a verb. You man a particular topic. You man ASCII. Yes. So six one in hexadecimal. Okay, so we go down the list here. Six one in hexadecimal is representing lowercase a. Okay? So that's authentication failure. Let's go back to the to the dump here. The zero zero, what does the byte zero does it have any special meaning in a string? It's a null terminator. Okay, it terminates a string. So what about that chunk after that? Seven, three, seven, five, da 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 da. That's the beginning of another string. Another string. Okay? In fact, if you compare the addresses, the first one is six one four, the second one is supposed to be six two eight. So let's see if this is actually 628. What is 27? 627 is referring to the 65. 628, 629, 628. Because it's hexadecimal, so you go from 9 to A, B, C, D. Okay. So in fact, this is the beginning of another string. It's kind of important. This is kind of cool. Okay, but what is 7 3? What do you think? You can kind of count it too because A is 1, right? So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Oops. Yeah. H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O. Okay, so that's one uh, round of hexadecimal number. And I have to go for another 3. O P Q R. Oh, I'm missing what S. Okay, so that's lowercase S for successful authentication. So if you read, if you look at the rest of them, it will say successful authentication. Okay, so that means six two A is corresponding to successful authentication. This is really helpful because if I go back to that one, okay, let me just. Look what put that again. Uh, let's go right here. Okay, so that means this is the beginning of the instruction to print successful authentication. In other words, I want to trick the computer to get to this location in memory. Is that okay? All right. So let's write down that number. Let's see, yeah, let's see where is my pen here. So let's write down that number. It is 400570D. Okay. So we want to continue execution at this location. Somehow cause the program to continue execution here. Even though the logic of the program says it's impossible. Okay. All right. So now we go ahead and run the program. We say dot slash get string. And remember the exploit file that I created earlier? We run it, and it says segmentation fault. Most people look at segmentation fault and go like, oh, this is a bad thing. The program just crashed. A hacker, on the other hand, would look at segmentation fault and say, this is a gold mine. There's a chance that I can break this program in the way that I want to break it. Okay? So, but segmentation fault by itself doesn't tell you anything. What you need to do is to use GDB, the debugger. An X-ray machine, basically. So you now say, OK, I'm going to run the program again, but this time inside GDB, inside the debugger. And then inside the debugger, you can still run the program just like before. And you can even redirect you know, stuff you know, from the file just like before. You press the Enter key, it gives you the same message. Okay, It says right here, program received signal, sig uh, sig segmentation fault. And then it gives you a location when it crashed, da 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 da. Seems like you know that's not really a whole lot of information. But wait a hold on a second here. We can now inspect registers. Do you guys remember the concept of registers? For the register bank, 
in the simulator. Okay? So as it turns out, you know, all real processes also have registers. There are several registers that are particularly important. Okay? One is called the stack pointer. We will get to all this stuff. Okay? So don't worry if you don't quite get to what I'm trying to do in this class, but we'll get to that. So there's one particular register called the stack pointer. And you can use IR for in info register. And then you, RSP is the name of the register. And it says, OK, that location is 7FFF, FFFF, E218. Okay? That's just one location in memory, which doesn't tell me much. But there's one thing I can do about this. I can display the content at that location. Okay? There's a command in GDB that says X for examine. So I can examine, I just pick a certain number of stuff that I want to infect. I like you know, um, 16 or multiples of 16. So 16 bytes and display those in characters, okay? Because I have a suspicion that this is a part of the file exploit1, one, exploit.1. One, and I want to display everything at where the stack pointer is pointing to. Okay, we'll get to all of this. I'm just giving you a preview of you know what we are dealing here, dealing with here. Okay, so it says you know space p lowercase o i j and so on, and these are content in the file exploit dot one. So I'm going to write it down because this is a really important clue. Is okay, it's pointing to this thing that is in the stack that is on the stack. So we'll go ahead and write down a space, a P, lowercase o, I, J, another space. OK, so that's, that will give me enough clue. So now what I do is I go back to the file, go back to exploit.1, and I try to locate that string. A space, P, O, I, J. So I'm going to use the search feature in VI, space, P, O, I, J. And it's right here. When you look at the cursor position, it's on position number 25, which means it is byte 25 counting from 1. This is the 20, 25th byte in the file. That location is important because once you understand how the stack is organized, then you will say, oh, if it crashes at that location, it must be a return instruction. A return instruction is, what you, is using what the stack pointer points to as a return address. In other words, it's interpreting the eight bytes starting at this location as quote unquote the return address. Now obviously it's going to crash because if you look at the eight bytes representing space P O I J space dash uppercase W eight F U one two, it's not going to match any actually useful location in memory. Okay, and that's why it crashed because it's attempted to continue execution at a place where there's no code to execute. But now that I know that I want it to go to this location, 400570, I want to force the program to go to that location. Is that okay? All right. So that means I have to change these locations, including this one and up to eight bytes after this location, I want to turn these eight bytes into zero, zero, a whole bunch of zeros, and then the least significant portion is going to be four zero zero five seven D. Is that okay? Just the general idea. Okay. The tool that I have, you know, VI is not going to do it, so I'm going to switch to the root user and install a particular program called Hex Edit. It's a really great, useful tool for hackers. Okay, so now that, that tool is installed. And let's say hex edit exploit one, whoops, exploit dot one. And I go to that location. Okay, you can you can tell that you know this space here is corresponding to this space here. Okay. So I can just start typing. But when you type, you have to byte kind of you have, you have to type backwards. Because it, because of NDNS. Now, what is NDNS? Let me start with what, how much you can store at each memory location. Okay, what do you think we can store at each memory location? Four bytes. A single? No, 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 just no. one byte. Okay, 
each byte has its own address. How do we know that is true from your C, C++ programming experience? The, the, the architecture is byte addressable. How do you know that? Okay, it's related to pointers, but what about pointers? You can pointers can access address. Uh, yes, yeah, so you can. A pointer can store an address, but when you dereference a pointer, you can get to whatever address it is pointing to. But how do you know that each chunk that has an address is one byte wide instead of sixteen bit wide instead of thirty two bit wide? How do you know that? Is it because the size of a pointer is a one byte? Not the size of a pointer, but the size of a character, a char. Okay? The size of a char is one byte. But when you look at pointers, one byte has one position, has one address. The next byte has a different address. So that means you know the architecture that you have been dealing with is what we call byte addressable, which is very common. Most architectures are byte addressable. So here comes the question. You want to store a 32-bit integer into a byte addressable architecture. How do you do that? Yeah. Well, it would take up how many positions, how many addresses is going to take up? A 32-bit number has how many bytes? Four bytes. Okay, And each byte has a different address. So now the question is, how do we chop up a 32-bit integer and store that into four byte locations. There are two ways to arrange it, two logical <coughs> ways to arrange it. Tell me what two ways are we talking about. Sorry? Forward or backwards. So what do you mean by forward and backwards? I kind of know what you're talking about, but I just want you to clarify. Start, uh, start from the, the ends of the door. Okay, very good. So it has to do with, this is what we call ending this. Okay, so we, if we look at a hexadecimal number, okay, it's just 32 bit, okay? So we look at a number, let's say it's um, 7F, 2D, 1, 2, 0, C, okay? How do I know this is a 32 bit number? Okay, each one is a hexadecimal digit, and how many different values can we represent? using one hexadecimal digit, 16, okay? Which also means one hexadecimal digit represents how many bits? Two to the power of what is 16? Four, okay? So each hexadecimal digit represents exactly four bits. How many hexadecimal digits do we have? Eight of those, so eight times four is 32, so we, we have a 32-bit number, okay? It's just represented in hexadecimal and not in the usual decimal, okay? So now we can say, oh, 0C is one byte, 1, 2 is one byte, 2D is one byte, 7F is one byte. Is that okay? Because your computer is byte addressable. So what you are talking about is, is the lowest address storing the 7F, or is the lowest address storing the 0C? There's no right or wrong answer. It is just a convention thing. Intel processors will store the least significant byte first, which means, you're right, 0C is going to have the lowest address. And then the 7F is going to have the highest address. This is called little endian, which means the least, the least significant digit or the least significant byte has the lowest address. Motorola went the other way. Okay? It is called big endian which means 7F, in this case, is going to be stored first. Now, this is not the only time when we have to deal with NDNS, because when you transmit bytes over a serial connection, TCP IP connection, the bytes have to be transmitted in order, right? So now the question is, are you going to transmit the 7F first, or are you going to transmit the 0C first? The protocol has to, be, has to make it clear, because otherwise numbers will be all jumbled up. And as it turns out, TCP IP is big endian. In other words, when you use TCP IP to transmit 32-bit um, integers, it will transmit the most significant byte first. Okay? There's no right or wrong answer, it's just pick one. Okay? 
Intel picks Little Endian, TCPIP picks Big Endian, Motorola picks Big Endian, uh, BAX, you know, not BAX, it's called Digital Equipment Corporation picks Big Endian. But it's, you know, there's no such thing as, you know, this is better than the other one, it's really just a convention. Now, the reason why this is important is because an address is really just a big number. In this case, this is going to be a 64-bit number because we are using a 64-bit architecture. So that means we have one byte here, one byte here, one byte here. Hey, but that's only three bytes. Where are the other five? They are implicit because we don't write leading zeros. So we have five other bytes, okay, but they're all zeros. One, two, three, four, five. So these eight bytes combined is the actual address that we want to get to. How is that important? Why do we care in the hexadecimal or the hex editor that we're dealing with here? Because we need to know how to specify this address. Do we specify the five zeros first, or do we specify the least significant byte, which is 7D first? Because it's little endian, we specify the 7D first. So we have to kind of spell things, quote unquote, backwards by spelling out 7D. Oops, that's not the right one. Uh, cursor, go, 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 go. 7D, that's the least significant byte. Now within the byte, we don't change, okay? We don't exchange the positions within the same byte. 0, 5, and then we got 4, 0, and then a bunch of zeros. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay. So I have just used a hex editor to change the content of a quote unquote text file to include binary numbers. So we still do okay so far with this exercise. The actual mechanism, don't worry, we will get to those things. It's just the approach of doing things, the approach of hacking this program. So I now change this particular input file that is known to cause the program to crash, but this time I'm causing it to crash in a very specific way because I am forcing it to jump back to main, but only at a, at a specific location. So control X will get me to exit this program. Yes, I do want to save the changes. So this time I can run this program again get stir, and redirect the input from exploit.1, and it says successful authentication. Now it will still give me a bus error or some kind of segmentation fault, but that's after the fact. I already gained control or I already end up with what I want. It's just that at the very end, the program still crashes, but it doesn't bother me anymore because I get to what I need. Are we doing okay so far with this little demonstration? Okay, how we read the instruction is besides the point, okay? The point is, if you know assembly language programming, if you know how memory or the stack is being used when you're dealing with a C, C++ program, if you know how not to write a program, which means you know that certain types of coding style can lead to problems, then you can hack. Okay, you can make a program do what it is not supposed to. That's hacking. Is this legal? It's your program. What I have done up to this point is 100% legal because it's my program. Yeah. I'm not hacking a Microsoft program. I'm not hacking a IRS program. I'm not hacking anything. I'm hacking my own program which I wrote the code at the very beginning of this class. So from the legal perspective, everything that I did is 100% legal, not a problem. How about morality? Did I do something that is immoral? Hacking my own program, or teaching you guys how to hack programs, isn't that bad? Why not? Makes you a better programmer. Makes you a program better programmer because Exactly, because if you know how not to code a program, then the code that you write is going to be more secure and less likely to be hacked. And why do I care about that? Because you might be the guy who writes the firmware of the pacemaker that I will have in my heart 20 years down the road. I don't want my pacemaker to be hacked. 
remotely by a Bluetooth device from Russia or some, from China, <laughs> right? You know, they, they go like, oh, I want to you know, play with taxi in a heartbeat. Let's bump it up, let's turn it down, bump it up again, turn it down again. That's how they kill the Iranian uh, nuclear reactor refinement thing. They just ramp up the speed, ramp it down, ramp it up again, the centrifuge. And as it turns out, those things are not really, they don't react to sudden changes well. So it killed the, uh, hmm? I don't know. <laughs> uh, irregular heartbeat usually means you're under stress already. Stressed out? I don't know yet. I don't think I'm stressed out yet. So depending on what you guys do in the lab, you know, it may continue that way, it may turn the other way. If they wanted to put you to sleep, they just have to put it really, really low, and then you just pass out. You just, uh, yeah, you just passed out. Yep. I'm just curious with the uh, export file, with, like after you use the text editor. Um, you mean you know, from a regular text editor? Right. Okay. It won't show it completely, but VI is pretty good with this stuff, okay? This is what it shows. So the uh, control app or the carrot app thing, those are all known characters, you know, the zero zeros. And then you see the control E, control E is a control character, so that would be a zero five, that's our zero five. Um, the curly brace, the close curly brace is the first letter, which is our four zero. So it still displays for the most part, you know, in DI, but the other editors may not show this at all. So the no characters won't even show up as, you know, the control add symbol. Yep. Then we need the rest of the stuff. Oh, well, the rest of the stuff is useless. So you could have just like... Yeah, I could delete. You mean from here? Yeah, you can delete all of that. In fact, you know, after you delete all of this stuff here, the program will crash in a different way, or probably crash, no, I guess not. But it's not needed anymore. <laughs> okay, so are there any questions about you know, the little demonstration? Did it help motivate you guys to continue with this class because now there's a new purpose of this class? Or are you guys thinking, I should have taken this class from Sac City? <laughs> yep. I was just wondering what's the process that gets to the fuck there. Like, we're, we're done with the L crash and supposedly we're exiting the program. Well, a bus error is referring to the address bus or the data bus, okay? So the one way to figure it out is to go into GDB and run the program from inside GDB. So we say exploit.1. So it says it is, it's a signal, sick bus error, and then you can use Google to kind of look it up and say, okay, what does it mean when I have a bus error? So bus error Linux. All right, so it's a fault raised by hardware notifying an OS that the process is trying to access memory that the CPU cannot physically address. An invalid address for the address bus. Hence, you know, hence the name. In modern use on most architecture, there are much, these are much rarer than segmentation faults, which occur primarily due to memory access violation. So you're basically specifying an address that is beyond what the bus can handle. Okay, what do you mean? What, what, what can, how did that happen? Because we have a 64-bit architecture, right? So every address up to 64-bit should not be a, be a problem. Okay, but when you look at the motherboard, how many bits do you have on the address bus? In other words, you, if you look at the motherboard, okay, for those of you who put together your own computer, is there an upper limit of how much RAM you can install on the computer? There's one. Is it exactly two to the power of 64, which is a huge number? No. It typically, it's what? Give me a number. 16 gig, 32 gig. On a server, it might go up to wait, what? 128 gigs. Okay. So let's think about 128 and say, okay, but how many bits are we talking about? 128 gigabytes. That's a lot of bytes. 128 gigabytes. How many bits do I need to address one giga location or one billion locations? Not a whole lot. Not really a whole lot, but how do you come up with that number? Come on, you guys. Okay. So 128 and 
Okay, what is what is one billion? One billion looks like this, yes. right? That's one billion. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I look at one thousand as hey, that's close enough to ten twenty-four. One thousand and twenty-four. So we say there's one twenty-four here, one twenty-four here, and there's one twenty-four here. Not exact, but close. What is, why do you think 1024 or 1024 is special? That's how many bytes Because, what? That's how much bytes are in a game. No. It's a power of two, very good. It is two to the power of? Okay, just, just work, work it out, work it out. You guys can do it. Yes, 10 is correct. So that's two to the power of 10, that's two to the power of 10, that's two to the power of 10. What about 128 itself? It is two to the power of? One, two, Nine. four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128. Two to the power of seven. So, how many bits do we need to make this entire address space byte addressable? Seven plus 30, 37 bits. So a bus error happens when you try to specify an address that cannot be represented using 37 bits in this particular case. So that's a bus error, which means you're trying to specify an address that is not physically possible because of hardware limitations. Is that okay? But the bottom line is, you know, I don't really care at that point because I don't really need, you know, all those bytes at that point. Okay. Any questions about uh, the little demonstration today? No questions. Nobody's asking, you know, can we do this with a GUI? Can we just point and click? <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't do point and click in most of my classes, you know, so there's no, there's no easy way to do it. Okay, all right. So with this, with all of this stuff, you know, kind of talk about and stuff like that, we can now get into assembly language programming, okay? Um, and with assembly language programming, you guys already have a virtual machine. Do you guys remember the virtual machine, the very first homework assignment? So what I'll do is I will stick with 32-bit instructions for the class, even though the, this demonstration is, is, is in 64-bit. For the instruction of this class, I will stick with 32-bit. So let's go back to the 64-bit virtual machine, which I have already installed, but I just want to point out where it is. It's for the first homework assignment. So when you go back to the first homework assignment, which is data and number representation, the first assignment, which is here, it has a link to download the virtual machine. Okay, So that's the virtual machine that we're going to use in this class, which is also what I will be using now. So I go to downloads and go to Linux as a folder. Uh, do these files look familiar to you, or vaguely familiar? Mm -hmm. Okay, because you know they, these are the content of that zip file. Okay, so if you have the virtual machine already downloaded and unzipped, you should see these files. If you're in Linux, you can just you know do a, a dot slash a dot start dot sh that will start up the uh, the virtual machine, and you know I'm hoping that this will this is bringing back some memory. Okay, even though on, in your case it's going to be a lot slower because um, in Linux I can do the accelerator, but in Windows the accelerator doesn't work. Okay? So that's why in this case it's a lot faster. And of course you know, nobody can actually read what is going on here. So I'm going to close or minimize the uh, virtual machine itself and I would use SSH to connect to it. And do you guys remember how to connect to the virtual machine? Or a port 2200. Yep. So in Linux, SSH is already a command, so there's no need to install or run PuTTY 
for those of you who insist on putty, there is, there is putty okay, you know, in Linux too, but you know, it's not needed. So I just use a command line you know, SSH to do it. Specify the port, 2200. Um, the username is user at localhost. So that will make a connection. And the user password, is it live or user? I think it's live. No, it's, it's user. Not. It's user. There we go. So I just log into the virtual machine, which is a 32-bit machine. The only reason why I use the virtual machine, even though I'm already in Linux, is 32-bit instructions are different from 64-bit instructions. For teaching purposes, it doesn't really matter which one I use, but since I have most of my teaching material referring to 32-bit instructions, so that's why I, I just stick with 32-bit instructions. Okay. <clears throat> Next question. How much RAM is being used by this virtual machine? There's a command called top, which is really useful because it shows you, it's kind of like a task manager thing. You know, it shows you all the vital stats of the virtual machine or an actual machine. So in this case, I have allocated 512 megabytes to the virtual machine, of which 445 megabytes or 400, let's call it 445, is free. So how much is it using? 512 minus 445. about 60 megabytes. So the virtual machine is only using 60 megabytes, which means if you allocate 128 megabytes to it, it's plenty already, okay? So the virtual machine is not really using up a lot of resources. I gave it half a gig you know, just to make sure that there won't be any problems. But if you need to reduce it because your laptop computer doesn't have enough RAM, go ahead and reduce that to 128. It will still be okay. Any questions? questions okay so let's go ahead and start to write our first program so I do a queue to get out of this one here and then we'll go make a new folder for CISD 310 go to CISD 310 and we'll go ahead and start to write the first program so I just call this prog 1 and when you write program in assembly it is conventional that you name the file with a dot lowercase as, as an extension it doesn't have to be like that at this point, but I just want you guys to get into the habit of using the right extension. It's just a text file. So I'll give you, you know, the first program. Um, there are several things that have to be there, and I'll explain what those things are. Dot global underscore start has to be here. Underscore start and the colon has to be here. And then you can specify the instructions. So what I'll do is I'll specify one single instruction, and then I'll explain what it is. So move L dollar zero to EAX, and that's it. That's the only instruction I want to talk about. Yep. I'm sure I messed up. When you open it, did you use Nano? I use VI, but Nano will work too. Okay. Yeah. For those of you who are really, really against using, you know, command line programs to edit the file, and you're using Windows. You can use WinSCP to create files and do text editing in WinSCP. Okay. Any questions? I can't really demonstrate that part because I don't have WinSCP installed in Linux. But it's just a text file. And the rest of the program is not really that important. You know, so I'm just going to ignore the rest of this program and just give it uh, just the same instruction. Okay, just so that I can, it won't crash when I debug it. All right, so looking at this kind of three-line program, let me just explain what each line is representing. And it helps if I display the line numbers. There we go. The first line, which says you know, dot global underscore start, is basically advertising to a quote-unquote linker and say, oh, underscore start is a special label. I want to make sure that everybody knows what underscore start is. It's exporting. Okay? It's exporting the label underscore start. And the significance of underscore start is it defines the starting point of a particular program. Okay? You can put it somewhere else. It doesn't have to be the first day. But underscore start defines where do I start with a particular program? So in this case, 
It's basically saying on line three, that's my first instruction. Line two is the actual definition of underscore start. Underscore start itself is a label. But when you see a label with a colon right next to it, it becomes the definition of a label, which is basically saying, oh, this label is now defined as this location. Which location are we talking about? The same location as the move L instruction. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay. On the third line, we have our first instruction. The first instruction is called move L for move long. Move long is moving 32 bit at a time. The important part is the dollar zero and percent EAX. The dollar zero is move immediate. In other words, the constant zero is a part of the instruction itself. The instruction, when we execute this instruction, is going to move the constant zero, the value zero, into a register that is called EAX. There are several registers, EAX, EBX, ECX, and EDX, and then there are a few others, okay? But for the, for the purpose of this demonstration, you know, we'll just say that, okay, EAX is one of the 32 bit registers. That's the entire program. Are we doing okay so far? Yep, go ahead. Uh, is it case sensitive? It is case sensitive. So if you use the wrong case, it won't work. Now, do we, uh, do we have to specify global? Does it have a default? Um, it does, but the linker will warn you and say that underscore start is not defined. So it is best to actually define underscore start as a linker. You have a question? Yeah. So it's going to move the zero to the EAX? It's copying. There's no such thing as moving when you when it comes to memory locations copy. and content. It's really just copying. So when you see the instruction move, it's really saying copy. Okay. It, it, it's because in real world I can move objects, right? You know this dry, uh, whiteboard marker used to be here, and I move it over here. What happened to the old location? It's not there anymore. But when you copy, when you have assignment statements, okay? So think about C and C plus plus x equals y as a statement in C and C++. This is copying. It's not moving. Because whatever was in y is still in y after this statement. So that's why the move as an instruction is a misnomer. This is the wrong name to describe the operation. But we are stuck with it. Okay, So it is, it, it is what it is. We call it the move instruction. But it really is copying the left to the right. So in this case, it's copying the constant zero into EAX. OK. Can someone remind me what is the von Neumann architecture? What is significant about the von Neumann architecture? It stores instructions in, in memory. OK. So in this case, because the constant zero is a part of the instruction, it's actually copying that zero from memory into the register. Are we doing OK so far with this? OK. You guys remember what we did with uh, LogiSim in the previous class? What did we do? Or what was one of the things that we did? We copy from RAM, you know, but the, yes, we did some memory. Uh, we, we did some copy between registers and the memory. So let's go ahead and see what is going. What needs to happen when we execute an instruction like this in logic Okay, because I want to look at these instructions. This is new this year. Okay, this is the first semester that I try to introduce instructions in the I386 instruction set and refer back to the logic scene and talk about you know this is what is happening inside the processor when we execute instructions like this. Okay, so this is all new. Which is great because it's something that I haven't done before. Okay, so we have Logisim and I may or may not have my processor downloaded. So let me go back and download it again. That will be in the control. This 
time I will store it to a place that is permanent, so I won't lose it again. Tag processor V2, and it's the more recent one, which is the 15 one. I need to change the name of these files. But it's okay. For now, it will just stick with this name. All right. So I'm hoping that this is looking vaguely familiar, right? Okay. Of all these registers, which one do you think is going to be important because it is pointing to a part of an instruction? There's the register bank. Those are all what we call general purpose registers, so they're not really useful other than oh, we can use it. We can use those to store the result of a calculation. So of all the registers that you can see in here, okay, one is called the address register, one is called PC, and one is called instruction register. Which one do you think is going to store the address of the instruction that I'm executing? PC, program counter, okay? So program counter is the one. So that means when we execute an instruction like the one that we are talking about before, the PC is going to be pointing to a part of an instruction. So what I'll do is I'm going to mock it up. Okay, so I go to the memory here and I just say that, okay, let's just say that this part here is storing the constant that I need to store into a register. Okay, so I'm trying to mimic what I'm doing in the assembly code. Is that okay? Okay, so we'll change this to, I don't know, 70, okay? And this location is 80. No, this is 08, 09, this is 08. So I will go back to the PC, the program counter, and change this to 0, what again? A, okay. All right. So what needs to happen in order for the PC to specify the address of the byte that I am trying to copy into a particular register in the register bank? And let's just say the reg uh, EAX is the first register. It's the same thing as the first register in the register bank. So what do I need to do? The first thing I need to do is to tell the memory module and say, hey, wake up, I'm selecting you. You know, I want you to do something. And how do we do that? Exactly, the selected of the brand module has to be selected. So, so it has to be asserted. So we put a one here. What do we have to do next? Now that the RAM module has waken up and go like, okay, tell me what to do, what, what do we want it to do? Do we want to read or write? We are reading, okay, very good. So when we're reading, do we want this bit to be a one or a zero? You, if you don't remember, that's okay, just hover over it. It says right here, if one load memory to output, which is a read operation. So we do want a one over here to specify what is coming is going to be a read operation. Okay, fine, it is a read operation. Where are we reading from? Which location are we, am I reading from? Oh, now this might take a little bit of time because I need somehow to connect the program counter as a register to the address bus, okay? So you can start with either one. You can start with either end. I will start with the address bus, okay? I want this to eventually connect to the program counter. Well, it's going through a box, okay, which is a multiplexer. Out of this box here, the program counter is connected to this line. This is 0, 1, 2, 3. This is you know, the third input into the multiplexer. I can only specify numbers as a binary number, so this particular driver select has to be a 1, 1 to specify that we want the output of the program counter as a register to specify the content of the address bus. Is that okay? So what I have done so far is wake up the RAM, specify this is a read operation, take the output of PC, the program counter, go through the mux, specify the mux to say, okay, pick, you know, the input of the pick input three to become the actual output. So now the output is specifying the location that the program counter is selecting. And as a result of all of these operations, the data bus now has the content at that location. HD is 1000101, which is also known as negative 115 if you choose to interpret this particular 8-bit number as a signed number. 
which we don't really care, okay? Because we just need to grab those you know, bit pattern and store it into register zero in the register bank. So I have done half of the operation already. What about storing this number in, that is already on the data bus into register zero? What do I have to do to get it done? Okay, well, first of all, you have to select that register as the input register. So we go to the register bank, and then we say the register input selection is 0, 0, 0. That's good. It is selecting register 0. Then we have to say enable. Okay, let's go ahead and pay attention. And then we also have something else to do. This is the address bus. We have to make sure that this box is selected correctly. And it is already selected correctly because the selection bit is a 0. And the data bus is going into the input zero. So we are okay as far as the mux is concerned. Which also means you know, the output of the mux should have the content that we want to store already. So now we have everything ready, except for one thing. How do we store something into a register? Clock cycle, okay? It, the clock has to go from low to high. There's only one clock in the entire processor. Okay, which is this one here. So I go from low to high and then go back to low. Now I want to go back into the register bank and make sure that register zero or the first register is storing the content of 8D in hexadecimal or 1001 in, in, in binary. So we double click or just right click and say view register bank. And we can see right here, this is the first register. It does have the content of 8D. So this is what is happening inside the processor when we execute that one simple instruction, okay, to move or to copy a constant that is stored as a part of the instruction into a register. Is that okay? Is that okay? All right. So if I want to use a pseudo C syntax to represent what is going on here, I can basically just say the register zero, treat it as if it is a variable, is getting the value zero. Okay, that's representing what is going on in logic sim. In C, I mean the, in assembly, you know, we can basically say EAX as a register is storing the constant or the value of zero. Kind of the same thing. This one is actually not the same. I didn't specify 0 as the constant, I specified 8D as the value. So I fix this one to 0x8D. There we go. Do we have any questions about that particular instruction? And how we specify a constant and how we specify a register? Let's go back to the source code and see, you know, syntactically speaking, what is funky about it. So it is a little funky. When you specify a constant, you need a dollar sign. The dollar sign is not specifying the unit. It is actually required as a part of the syntax. So the, a very natural question is, uh, what if I forget about the question mark, uh, the, the dollar sign? What is it going to do then? Okay, I will answer that question. The second thing is, when you specify a register, in this case, this register is EAX, you have to use the percent symbol as a prefix. So the percent symbol is required as a prefix to specify a register. There are other registers, EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX, ESP, EBP, those are the registers that we will end up using in this semester. But that's just the syntax. Uh, do we have any questions at this point? Yep. So you specify EAX, but specifically register zero zero. Mm, EAX is kind of the first register, but there's no real actual ordering, but I think EAX does map to the first register. Okay. And what do you think about the names EAX, EBX, ECX, and EDX? Do you think they are chosen because they are just the first four letters in the alphabet, or do you think there are other reasons? Yeah, it's a loaded question. Okay, EAX the A stands for accumulator. EBX the B stands for base register. ECX the C stands for counter. EDX the D stands for, I don't remember. D 
stands for I cannot remember. I cannot read that fourth. Hmm? That fourth. No, it has a particular meaning. Okay, so we'll look up the EDX register and see if data sounds about right. It's the data register. Okay, but why? You know, why do they, why why do they have these you know kind of awkward names? It's because at one point in time, the 8080 processor, which is the grand, grand, grandpa of the x86 architecture, has special purpose registers. Some registers can only be used for certain things. If you want to do calculations, addition, subtraction, and stuff like that, you have to use EAX. If you want a register to store an address, you have to use EDX. If you want to count number of times that you want to go through a loop and stuff like that, you have to use ECX. And if you want to store data or store the result of you know, some data, you have to use EDX. So each one is called a special purpose register because at one point in time, they were special. Somewhere along the line, these became what we call special, uh, general purpose registers, which means they're all pretty much interchangeable except for certain instructions that must use certain registers in a certain way. But for the most part, they're called general purpose registers because they can be they're somewhat interchangeable. If one instruction can use EAX, it can also use EDX, ECX, and EDX. All right. All right, so the next thing I want to explain is what if we forget that dollar sign? Okay, see this dollar sign here? What is the likelihood that somebody's going to forget it? Pretty high, okay, because it doesn't seem to be important, right? So the question is, if I change this program so that you know, there's no dollar sign in front of the zero, what does it mean? Well, what it means is zero is no longer specifying the value that we are copying to EAX. Instead, it is specifying the address from which location will copy the content. Now, let me use the pseudo syntax here to explain it. This is corresponding to move L dollar zero to percent EAX. Is that okay? That's the instruction that we have just talked about. If you forget the dollar and the instruction becomes move L, just a zero, comma, percent EAX, then the pseudo C syntax becomes like this. EAX is the result, but you're not copying zero anymore. You are actually dereferencing zero. You're treating zero as an address. You go to location zero, and then you copy whatever was is there into the register. <coughs> Can everybody see the difference between these two? And this is also the first semester that I, that I tried to use pseudo C syntax to explain you know, what is going on inside the processor. But is that okay? I mean, is it clear enough to most of you? Yes. Okay. So now the question is, oh, what is exactly at location zero? What happens when I try to run this program without the dollar sign? Location zero inaccessible, okay, which means this program is going to cause a. Okay, first of all, is it a bus error or is it a segmentation fault? Is a seg fault? Why is it not a bus error? Because it's within range, exactly. Okay, zero is within range except this particular program, this particular process, does not have access to it, so it will give you a segmentation fault. Okay. How do we do that in assembly? I mean, in uh, logic scene. What does it correspond to in logic scene? What do you think? We have to go to a memory location, read the content of that memory location because it's a, it's a part of the instruction, and then in return we have to use that as the address again to specify the address bus one more time. So let's go ahead and take a look at the okay. Based on what we have in logic sim, how are we going to do this? So we switch back to the logic sim picture. 
go back to the main screen here. And by the way, do you, it didn't specify the, the correct input. The program counter is supposed to increment you know, for each clock cycle unless you tell it not to. And in this case, it is not incrementing because I did not specify that it has to be updated like that. It's not enabled, so it's not updated. Okay, so let's go ahead and change the instruction here. And let's say you know the location is actually, I don't know, zero, 04 here. And then at location zero, 04, I have another byte. Let's say we have the content of 23. And this location, okay, this location at location zero, D, zero A is a part of the instruction. It specifies the address where I'm going to grab a byte to store into a register. Is that okay? So we want to see do we have the mechanisms, the necessary mechanisms to do all this stuff here. Certain things we have already done. Okay, we have already selected the RAM, we have already specified the read operation, all that stuff is done already. So the output to the data bus is already 0, 04, okay, just like that. Except this time I don't want to update a register in the register bank because the target is not to store the 0, 4, the target is to store the 2, 3 at location 4. So I can, I'm can i not going to do this. In other words, I will turn off register in enable because I don't want to update any register at this point in the register bank. Out of all the registers that are still visible on screen right now, which one do you think I want to overwrite with 0, 4, which is going to be the address that I want to use later on. The address register. That's the purpose of the address register, is to do something like that, okay? So you look at the address register, and you look at the D port here, and say, okay, but how do we connect it? Well, it's already connected to the data bus, which is great. But how do I update it? Just because the D port is connected doesn't mean it will update itself according to what is on the data bus. So how do we update the address register? We need a clock and we need the enable, okay? So the first thing we need to do is to do the enable here and just say, hey, address register, I need you to pay attention. And then the second thing we have to do is to give it a clock cycle, okay? Clock high, you can see it has the content already. Clock low, now we have the address register updated. What do we need to do next? The address register now contains the location where we want to go to copy the act, the actual byte into the register. What do we need to do? What do we need to do next? We need to connect the mux. We need to connect the address register to drive which bus? The address bus. Okay. In other words, we want the output of the address register to hook up to the address bus, which is here. And the only way to do that is to change the box. So we look at the output of the address register. This is you know, input two, which means in binary, we specify one, zero, okay? So by switching the box to connect to the address register, now the address register is specifying which location RAM do we want to select. And if I scroll over horizontally to the RAM module, you can see that the target byte is now selected. And what do we need to, need to do next? Kind of the same thing as last time, okay? We have to enable the register in select of the register bank, okay? And say, okay, register bank, we are now ready to give you a value to store. Then we have to pick a particular register to store that value. So let's say we're dealing with register four in this case. So we turn on this particular bit to specify register four, and then we do a clock. Okay, clock high, clock low, and then we look into the register bank and see that register four, in fact, now has a content of two, three. Can everybody see how this process is quite different from the first one? Because the part of the instruction is no longer specifying the value that we are going to store, it is specifying the address of the location where we want to copy to the to a to a register. Which one do you think is faster to execute? The first one or the second one? The first one. 
Why is it faster? Fewer steps. Fewer steps, okay. And what is the slowest part of all of these processes? Access and memory. The first one needs to access memory how many times? Once. The second one? Twice. Because the first access is to get the location itself, the second access is to get the actual content at that location. Do we have any questions about the question of whether the what the dollar sign actually means? So if there's one thing you want to write down because you know this is not on the projector, it would be this. And the key is without the dollar sign, you have a D reference. Which is kind of counterintuitive because you would think, hey, D reference is an extra operation, so maybe we should specify a symbol to mean you know D reference. Well, the syntax doesn't work out that way. Okay, you, you use a dollar sign to say there's no dereference, but when you actually need dereferencing, you need to you know, get rid of the dollar sign. Okay, are there any questions about the these particular instructions? Can you guys move the content of one register to another register? Do we have the necessary hardware to do that? So let, let's just you know, give it a try. So I want to do a e, something that's equivalent to this, okay? I want the content of EBX to be stored in EAX, make a copy of that, okay? And the instruction to do this, what do you think it's gonna look like? EBX percent. Yep, good job. That's correct, because the first operand is the source, the second operand is the destination or the sink. Okay. All right, so let's see how we can do this, whether we can do this in our design or not. Okay. We just want to copy the content of one register to another register. So let's say we want to copy register 4, which now has a content of 2, 3, into register 7, the last register. Okay. How do we do that? How do you go about analyzing this diagram and say, okay, maybe it's possible, maybe it's not. Let's see how we can do it. You look at the input of the register bank, okay, which is this one here. Okay, and do you see a direct connection from here to um, one of the output registers? No, nope, there's no direct path. Because this mux only allows you to either go to the address bus, which is this one here, or you can go to the alternative, which is the result of the ALU. Is that okay? But one of these is useful, because this one here, you can see this one eventually connects to the output of the register bank, or one of the outputs of the register bank. Is that okay? So how do we specify that we want register four to be the source and register seven to be? Am I really that boring that the <laughs> microphone would die on me? <laughs> it just fell asleep. It just fell, I'm so bored. I thought you just started whispering for a second there. Hmm? I thought you just started lowering your voice and whispering. Oh, no. Yeah. Like, okay, so let's, let's go ahead and get this done. I think we, well, we got two minutes. Okay, so we do have the output connecting through the box back into the input. So it is possible, okay? We just have to figure out how to poke up the mux to do that. The mux is already set up to do it because the mux has a zero as a selection. This is input zero, which is connecting to output zero of the register bank. So we got the setup already. We just have to specify which register is the output. Register 4 is the output. We have to specify which, which register is the input or which one is supposed to be updated. Register 7 is the one that we want to update, so we specify 7 here. We have to remember to turn on the output, which means you know we have to enable the output. Ooh, what is this? What is going on here? Yeah, close that. We got two competing gangs on the bus. It's a bus fight. Okay, but why do we have a bus fight here? Who is you know? 
because the RAM is trying to drive the data bus, and so is the register bank. Okay, so that's why we have a bus byte. That's okay. We can just tell the RAM module to pipe down. Okay, so now the RAM module is no longer selected. It's not driving the bus anymore. Okay, but let's double check. Okay, do we have the right output from this part here? Okay, it is zero one zero zero one zero, which is a two zero zero one one, which is a three. It is in fact the content of register four from earlier. And we have now selected register seven, but nothing is going to happen until. What are we waiting for? The clock. Okay. So we need the clocks to go from low to high, and I usually just make it go back to low immediately. And it is safe to turn off everything, you know, afterwards. Okay. So we'll, we'll but we'll, we want we want to just take a look at the register bank and say, did we copy the content of register four to register seven? We did. And do you think this? How do you compare these three instructions in terms of execution time? Did we access memory with the last instruction? Nope. So that makes it the fastest of the three. Because a register to register transfer or copy is always really fast. Is that okay so far? So let me just give some feedback. Is the use of logisim helping you understand the instructions? Or is it just making it worse? It's helping a little bit. Okay. Good. All right. So I think we are running out of time today, and I don't have any new homework assignment for you guys. Yes. <laughs> it just means I'm piling up, <laughs> stockpiling. All right. So I'll see you guys on Thursday, and make sure that you kind of re review the material today, you know, just to make sure that you know how the operations occur inside the process. I have a general logism question. Go ahead. I 